kind of applications, this is possible. And the main like like uh, underlying phenomenon is just to explain it simply that our input is really extremely high dimensional. I can only show it here in like two dimensions, but. Uh, even if you have like a, a perfectly working classification in practice and you optimize it on like like millions of uh, possible input training samples and you optimize like two million of parameters, the number of possible inputs is way larger than this set. There might be inputs which will never appear in practice, but you can just deliberately construct such and you can find like transformation which will move like this red dot to uh, the other side of the classification boundary and cause misclassification. And it's fairly easy to done in practice. And this was shown in like 2014 by Ian Goodfellow, who just demonstrated that if you have a, a well working network, you can just find a really low intensity noise and you can tune this, this noise. So this is a special noise, it's not random at all, but the intensity is really, really low that if you add this to the image, you're input will be misclassified and you can see that this shows that like like these applications that are not really robust in practice and it also demonstrates that uh unfortunately it's it's different than like like it concentrates on other features than human perception like to us the two images are really identical even though the network is like entirely uh, certain that it's it's 99% that it's an, a completely other object on this image. So that's a problem. Uh, luckily, these attacks are not that practical. But later, it was shown that you can also do this not just by using low and low intensity noise, but you can use like certain patches where which contains like like really strong features. And if you present it as part of the input, it will suppress all other features which are coming from uh, the original input image and if this patch is present, it doesn't really matter what what is the background or what what are the other objects in the input. It will always be detected as like a toast, or a toaster. Sorry, yeah. So uh, and this is a problem. And you can imagine putting the stickers on like cars, and cars might be classified as pedestrians or just road. Or you can put this on stop signs and then turn them into uh, just simple uh, speed limit sign or make them even disappear. And this was demonstrated, I tried to like, like sorry, just show the papers if you're interested in the details, that uh, these are really robust in practice and these can be applied. And if you put the stickers there, it doesn't really matter what the scale of the object is or what is the angle, like the view angle where it is seen, it, it will just maintain this power of misclassification and you can make object uh, disappearing and I showed examples of classification but this is general you can show this on uh, detections as well uh, like this is an example when if a person puts up this this patch uh, and it doesn't matter like the clothing and other features of the person like anybody who puts this up it will not be detected by one of uh, one of a commonly applied networks so this is significantly a problem and and we, it's something that has to be investigated and another important aspect is that these features doesn't necessarily or or doesn't has to be like have have to be sorry like uh, on the image plane it's not necessary that you put this on like pixels. It's a really interesting phenomenon, which is just sort of recently published that uh, you can find this as like transformations, like different rotations, uh, different affine transformations and things like that, that in like a simulated environment, you can alter the original object and cause misclassific misclassification. And on, on one hand, this is like like really uh, a threat because it means that you can find certain clothing, certain uh, shapes or certain angles which, which uh, shows the weaknesses of the network. On the other hand, it's good because you can generate like weak samples and put this back to the training set and just increase the robustness. So I just want to show that adversarial examples are sometimes really useful because I just want to show you some funny cases where the important thing is like, like how, uh, relevant your samples are like this is like th these are images which are really similar both to humans and both to networks and i can show you other images of dogs and bagels and these are nice and and, and interesting uh but the other question which i want to also cover is that because i wanted to demonstrate that other serial samples exist that what can be done to like prevent them or or like like 
use applications knowing that that these are, are really exploitable weaknesses. One thing is that people are working on this to to create like robust networks. Unfortunately, this is interesting, but I haven't seen any networks which would be like like that resilient and robust against adversarial attacks. That it's not possible to do them. You can just just increase like like how complex is it it is to generate an adversarial attack, but it's not a safe way. Another way is to detect adversarial attack. This is uh, our paper from a, a few years ago where we said that we can identify like an important uh, importance of a region and. This is a good against like patch based attacks that if we cover this with random noise, you can investigate how much will the classification of the networks drop. And if you see that like the decision comes from like two small regions, then you can identify that, okay, if here it really drops, then this region was really important in the uh, classification process. And if it's not covering like a larger region comes from small patches, then most likely it is a patch based adversarial attack. For, for example, this is a cipher based method. So I just wanted to mention this as an example as like detection methods are there, but these are also not like 100% uh, safe. Like most detection uh, algorithms, not just ours, but, but everything which I've seen were published are around like 70, 80% accurate. And another thing which I want to just, just mention, and this is our like re most recent result, which is still under review, that what can you do if you detected an adversarial attack? And, and this is like, according to my knowledge, the first paper which deals with this, because even if you detect that, okay, this image was attacked, what action should you make? Should you make like what can you do? You cannot just stop traffic and like stop before an intersection. Uh, so you have to do something, and we try to like recover from adversarial attacks. And the idea was that if we try to like do a counter attack towards all possible classes, then the easiest to attack will be the original class. And this can be seen from our measurement, and you can see the accuracy results here. And you can see it doesn't really matter what the original attack was and what the counter attack was. The easiest was always to attack the original class because most of the features are already there on the image plane. So uh, that's there, but I also want to mention that these are also not like foolproof or 100% accurate. Like even if you reach like 90% accuracy or 80% accuracy, it means that one or two times out of 10 cases, the attack will work. And that's a significant threat if you think about like on a highway where like thousand cars are going and you, I don't know, just make a car or make, make an object disappear. So I just wanted to reveal this aspect of uh, adversarial attacks and uh, and how they could be uh, done in practice and what, what can be done to prevent them. Uh, and thank you for listening. And if there are any questions later, I, I, I'm glad to try to answer them. Okay, let me try to unmute myself. So uh, thank you, Anders, very much. And this was quite, uh, quite interesting. And uh, we will come back with questions to you for sure. So uh let me try to change the role for our next presenter and hopefully you will have now the button greened so so we heard now that uh that's in understanding can be fooled in a way and uh, the question is actually uh whether we are there yet to speak about attacks so Let's take one step back and uh, consider the question whether scene understanding is robust enough in itself to enable self-driving. Uh, if we omit for the for, for the for the time being the the possibility that some people, uh, some malicious people, put up stickers on the on the stop signs. And to get an answer to that question, we have here Shandor Jordan. So he's from Continental Automotive, and he's claiming in his abstract that. Uh, that the autonomous vehicles are not anymore science fiction. So let us hear from him the reality of self-driving. So Shanta, the floor is yours. So uh, can you hear me? Yes. It is a very good news. Okay, so let's find out what is the reality. I would like to greet everybody in the name of Continental. We are celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. And when I was a child, autonomous vehicles was the part of science fiction, which served as an inspiration for me and for my colleagues to make reality from fiction. We haven't reached the end of the road. We are currently continuously working to bring fully autonomous vehicles to life, but AI supported vehicles are not a dream anymore. 
I am Shandor Jordan, machine learning expert at Continental, and today I will show you what is the reality of autonomous vehicles in 2021. Continental Vision Zero is to reach the point when there will be no zero crashes, zero injuries, and zero fatalities. We are on the wrong road to reach it. We can think about the seed bed as an early and very early tool to prevent injuries, but more recent examples is the ESC, the Electronic Stability Control, which is an important collision avoidance system currently available and the most significant advance in vehicle safety since the introduction of the seat path, I think. This anti-skid technology has already served tens of thousands of lives. On dry, wet or slippery roads, if the vehicle starts to skid, ESC corrects the slide by reducing engine torque and uh, breaking individuals' wheels to bring the vehicle back on course. The system uses sensors to continuously monitor the stability of the vehicle when an unstable state is detected. ESC responds in milliseconds and stabilizes the vehicle. But we have to go further and, and apply additional AI-based active safety technologies also to reach our zero vision. Continental has partnered with Global NCAP to launch the Stop the Crash information campaign. The aim is to achieve significant improvement in global road safety and steadily reduce the number of traffic fatalities, injuries, and crashes. The European Union has a similar vision, namely the goal of zero road fatalities and serious injuries by 2050. And you could say that 2050 is far and it is not the reality yet, but nowadays we definitely make a big step in that direction. The European Union introduced a new regulation to enhance safety standards for car manufacturers, which will significantly reduce the number of road casualties and injuries. This regulation describes new technologies and system that will become mandatory for new vehicles of different types. This new regulation updates the old general safety regulation that was introduced in 29, which is more than 10 years old already. It were to highlight that the first uh, for the first time, the new regulation addressed the specific concept of vulnerable road users, in particular pedestrians and cyclists. There are lots of new safety features and has to be implemented by every car manufacturers. But I would like to focus on three points that are interesting for us now because these are really AI related fields. First of all, advanced emergency braking systems. This is important if we want to prevent collision, but can be a product of only a second of distribution. To solve this problem, you can think about cameras and lighters. Next feature, emergency lane keeping system. This is a task that asks for a vision-based solution, of course. And finally, but not least, enlarge head impact protection zones capable of mitigating injuries in collisions with vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists. And large head impact zones are important, but much better if we can prevent the collision itself with the detection of pedestrians and cyclists in time, and we can draw the driver's attention for the vulnerable transportation participants or make the necessary evasive action. This feature will be required for all cars and vans, which is very important. Uh, but besides these, there are more interesting incoming features, and these features have to be equipped by all motor vehicles, not just cars and vans, but all motor vehicles. So not just cars and vans, as I said, but trucks, buses, and so on. One example is the advanced driver distraction warning system. The another one is driver drown, droniness and attention warning system. It means AI-based solutions not only has to pay attention to the surroundings of the vehicle, but inside also. But you could ask, how far are we from these features? Good news, all of the aforementioned features and more will be mandatory for every new series of cars and vans. And the better news, everything will be mandatory for every single new car and van in the European Union in 2024. For me, it means that AI supported vehicles are reality. Some of the high end cars are already equipped with these functions, but Time is ticking and soon every car will be equipped with AI. So Continental has a vision and the European Union has a regulation, but how can we measure the quality of these features? I am sure that most of us heard about the European new car assessment program shortly, the Euro NCAP. These are the guys who get vehicles to crush them and make videos about them. And of course, rank the vehicles based on their safety features. Safety test about adult occupant and child occupant is so-called the crash test. 
if you cannot avoid the trouble, the crash, then let's make the vehicle more safe during the impact. However, the green and the purple boxes are different. These are more than simple, the, simply the crash test. Vulnerable road users are, for example, pedestrians and cyclists. We would like to prevent the accident with advanced emergency braking, shortly AEB. You can gain, you can again think about lidars and cameras. We have to recognize pedestrians and cyclists and understand the situation. And if it is necessary, then stop the vehicle or make the evasive maneuver. The safety assistant category contains more AI related possibilities. We haven't talked about speed assistance yet. I requires to recognize traffic signs, which is feasible with AI. This is again clearly a vision based task. We can see another advanced emergency braking situation when we prevent the collision of two vehicles. This is similar to the aforementioned case with pedestrians and cyclists. Lane support is another task is the, in the renewed NCAP test. The vehicle has to draw an attention if it tries to pass the lane. It could prevent lots of accidents, what was resulted of a bad visibility conditions, for example. And there is a test also for occupant status monitoring to find out if the driver needs some rest or not. We have a vision, we have a regulation, we have a test from coming from NCAP, but it is not enough. We need hardwares and softwares because these are the enablers for this technology. Continental can provide various environment sensors like uh, cameras, lidars, radars, and control units provide the necessary information for highly automated driving. One of the most famous AI related products is the multifunctional camera with LiDAR. It integrates an infrared short range LiDAR sensor and a CMOS camera into a single compact unit, which can be installed in the mirror or base, even in small cars. So here there are two highly competitive sensor technologies integrated in one housing. The sensor module is able to categorize objects in front of the vehicle with a very high level of reliability and detect any imminent collision. If the relative speed of the detected object is less than 50 km per hour, a crash can be completely avoided. If the speed differences are greater, emergency braking will significantly reduce the force of the impact and crash severity. In addition, the camera-based driver assistance functions, such as lane departure warning, traffic signs recognition, and intelligent headlamp, headlamp control can be provided as usual. Moreover, pedestrian detection is also possible. But hardware and software alone is not enough. We have more enablers at Continental, especially in Budapest. Huge, huge amount of computational power is required for developing modern artificial intelligence solutions. For this, we have one of the most powerful computer clusters in the AI in the automotive industry, according to the top 5,000 list. And it uses green energy. We have a team team of more than 100 AI engineers and experts who work on the presented challenges on a daily basis. And as we know, there is no machine learning without data. So we have a data source coming from Continental's own test vehicle fleet, more than 15,000 kilometers per day. And with these, we have managed to support car manufacturers to get the five stars rating on the NCAP test. AI assisted vehicles are already on the road and from 2022 and 2024, only AI assisted, AI assisted cars will be manufactured to the roads of the European Union. And these are not the fully autonomous vehicle solution, what we are working on, but I hope I can present those to you in the near future. Until that time, AI is in the road and it will travel with us. And uh, let me show some videos about in action.
So this is not the fully autonomous vehicles yet, but AI in the road. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Andor. So, <clears throat> okay, so uh, so it's not here yet. Uh, algorithms can be fooled, we found out earlier, right? And now we have seen that we have some features of self-driving, but it's not yet fully self-driving. Uh, so we need to have humans who oversee them, most probably. And the question uh, from that regards is how can a human oversee the, the operation of uh, of uh, self-driving cars or, or assisted cars? And uh, questions arise like what is the time required for a person to switch from a I am not paying attention mode to an I am fully aware holding my hands on the steering wheel mode? And I think we will hear some answers to those questions from Thomas Heidegger. He's an associate professor uh, at Oudo University. And I'm, I'm trying to pass to him the presenter, right? If I... Looking forward to it. Yeah, good yes. afternoon, everyone. And, Thank um, you. Let's, now let's you should in. have it. Not yet. Uh, Maybe now something is changing, updating. Yay. Tomas, are you still there? Are, are you hearing me still? I think the others can hear me. I can see Shrandor moving, so I, I think we are we are fine. Yeah, we can, so, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, maybe maybe we we will switch to to your part and before Tomas is able to uh, sorry to to join uh, back and uh, yeah I will so yeah so. Uh, so last but not least, then then, then Tomás will be back. But but uh, before that, we will hear from Peter Siladi, who is senior scientist and uh, distributed member of technical staff at Bell Labs. Uh, why are onboard sensors of the car not, cars not enough, or why does it make sense to have connected cars, where connections could happen to nearby cars or roadside sensors and even remote infrastructure? So Pe Peter, could you take over from here? Thank you. And then Tomas will be back, hopefully. Yeah, thank you, Laurent. So, in the end, I'm going to talk about uh, the connected vehicles, uh, communication and analytics. So, first, let's uh, look at, at, at the vehicles and then let's discuss what is a connected vehicle and what connection can add to the capabilities of an individual vehicle. So, as we heard from um, Chandler, for example, vehicles nowadays are becoming um, loaded with sensors which make them quite capable of detecting and even reacting to environmental events or even traffic events but um, what about communication uh, so the state of the art of uh, vehicles equipped with communication is that they have one or two three sim cards and they are connected to the internet to specifically to the automotive manufacturer's own cloud if you have a Volvo car, then it's a Volvo cloud. If you have a, a Volkswagen, then it's Volkswagen car, uh, cloud. And then you are able to run a few applications on your car. And uh, you are eligible to, let's say, remote um, 
software upgrades or some some limited uh, digital services but um, is this what we mean by connected vehicle and um, the answer is no actually connected vehicles uh, are pretty well defined in the uh, standards as well as in the ICT industry and there are even two standards prevailing standards uh, which enable vehicles, nearby vehicles, or even long-range vehicles to communicate with each other. And the first and older standard is uh, based on Wi-Fi technology, so it's not even cellular. It's a to p standard, or there's a newer version of it coming up. And it was developed for car-to-car -car communication, nearby, line of sight, few hundred meters at most uh, range. Although the communication range can be extended by uh, deploying so-called RSUs, roadside units, uh, let's say along highways, which um, relay messages between cars. So what are the cars communicating in this uh, setup? They share um, a few times per second their position, speed, maybe acceleration, maybe some few bits of state uh, with each other. And this is really a kind of a broadcast uh, service. Every car is sending these messages about itself. And if it's within the range of communication of other cars, then it is collecting that and uh, it can be utilized by the onboard intelligence. And um, of course, it could be augmented with the additional SIM cards, which bring in cellular technology. Um, but if the two subsystems are disconnected, then basically cellular technology is serving one kind of use case, communicating with the backend servers of the car manufacturer. And then the other, this Wi-Fi base, also called ITS G5 layer of communication, it is serving this kind of awareness information sharing among cars. So this was also recognized by 3GPP that connecting vehicles is useful because an individual vehicle's range, the information that it can collect about other vehicles, will be elevated. So if you think about what can you collect by a camera versus what if you get the information digitally about all the cars that are within one kilometer range? And obviously you would get much more information, even if limited per car, uh, by using uh, some kind of communication. But the shortcomings of this Wi-Fi based communication and, and the opportunity here have uh, uh, created a new technology stack, which is based on 3GPP solar technology uh, to cover vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure, vehicle to server, vehicle to anything. This is called V2X type of communication with cellular technology. And what this means is that cars directly to cars, they can communicate via 3GPP, LTE, but now also with 5G. And then the same cellular technology, not exactly the same waveform, but of course the same stack can be used to connect the car with backend servers or connect the car with traffic lights or even with pedestrian smartphones so that the v2v and v2x kind of connectivity based on cellular can provide really a wide range and versatile connectivity so your car will get digital accurate and real-time information about every road participant this is of course the promise it requires that all those road participants carry at least the device which is able to connect but well, technically uh, now the enablers uh, are there but then the question comes, okay, but, but why? What, what is really the use case? So it's fine that my car connect, collects information about other cars, but what would happen with that information? And uh, there are a few use cases I would like to just show for, let's say, provoking some thoughts. Um, so one is, is kind of um, the, the whole theme. It's not really a particular use case, but what says the, the theme for the whole use case is that uh, uh, cars participating in digital communication um, bring an opportunity for fusion, sense of fusion, information fusion with what? With other road participants, other type of traffic. Um, now people are already communicating digitally while they are moving. Uh, every pedestrian now looks almost more into his or her smartphone than under their feet, which is becoming a bit dangerous, by the way. Uh, so they are carrying a device which is connected, which is communicating, downloading, uploading. They are commuting using public transport. They are carrying loads of megabytes uh, with every bus that you see on the road. So connecting vehicles into that mass of communication and connecting other environmental stuff like cameras, 
sensors, environmental sensors, weather sensors, uh, um, car sensors, also traffic sensors, parking sensor, all of these, and fusing them together, like providing an analytics on top of all of this data correlated with each other provides unprecedented vision into what is happening in a city or in a highway. And then it just depends on the type of analytics and type of use case developed on top of this data uh, to, to really utilize that. What use cases? For example, we discussed that, that, that okay, self-driving cars are not yet really uh, out on the market, but um, it is clear that if you drive a car and if you drive a recent car, then um, you might have experienced that the car is trying to tell you more and more things make you aware about more and more situations, which is, in general, you can say it, it's a good intention, um, although um, it depends on the delivery of the information to you, the human driver, who is still fully responsible of driving your car, uh, whether it is really uh, an advan advancement for you or it is just, technology, just an annoyance to you. So it really depends on how the interface between the vehicle and the human user is designed. And what you see now is just an example of um, a piece of information that could only be collected digitally via car to car or car to infrastructure and infrastructure to car communication. If there's a corner which really shades the vision between the two cars and, and you are approaching this intersection with really high speed, which you shouldn't by the way, but if you do, and another car is coming, which you cannot really see, then all the sensors in your car will not save you from basically crashing into that other car except communication, which digitally transfers the piece of information that another car is coming from the right, and you should slow down. Um, of course, people were driving before uh, computers were common, so they avoided these incidents by driving carefully, which of course I can still recommend. However, this is just one example of how the corner cases of obvious, and not everybody is driving carefully, unfortunately, would be um, you know, improved with technology. Now, another um, and more importantly, you know, popping up use case in the context of self-driving, and especially within the transition from manual driving to fully self-driving, is a teleoperated driving. Um, so, one use case for tel so what is teleoperated driving? I guess everybody get guessed from the image. Uh, somebody has a cockpit, like PlayStation or, or whatever other uh, gaming platform. But instead of driving a car in a simulator, they are actually commanding a physical car somewhere in the roads um, with their, let's say, steering wheel and, and pedals and whatever in interfaces implemented. Yeah, they usually get a high bandwidth camera feed from the car, around from around the car, so maybe multi-angle vision from the car. They use their own human driver skills and human vision to steer the car. Um, obviously, this is not stealth driving. It is like somebody drives the car, not from the car itself. And why is it important? So one is that sometimes this is really what we want or what, what some use cases want. Let's say you really want to drive a car or a vehicle, but you don't really want to be in the car because the car is at a very dangerous situation or it's working in a chemically uh, loaded uh, environment or, or in a minefield or whatever. So obviously then the use case is this one itself. But then there's another angle of why this might be a use case in the foreseeable future until self-driving becomes you know, the only way of driving because it is re requested by regulations. Because regulations have now um, basically detected that, that uh, self-driving technology is not existing uh, yet. And when it will start to come into existence and deployment, it will not be perfect. So it will encounter situations when it really cannot drive a car. It is just stuck. And then uh, if that particular car is fully loaded with humans who are incapable of driving, because none of them know how to drive, uh, then a professional driver from remote could jump in. So this is one direction where the still operated driver is also heading. And finally, um, it is just an arbitrary other use case is that um, if we would reach the self-driving realm saying that every car is driven by uh, a computer, then the question also comes, which computer? The car itself, based on the information it collects by its own sensors, plus maybe V2X, like we discussed, 
Or is it better to outsource the scheduling, let's say, of traffic in, in um, complex intersections and complex traffic scenarios to some central logic, which can take into account what is the trajectory of the cars, uh, when they will exactly enter a trajectory, or, or will they exit from the first uh, uh, right uh, turn or, or where they are going to go, and can pace the cars, um, so slightly increase the speed, Speed, slightly decrease the speed, just to avoid crashes without, let's say, requiring traffic lights blocking traffic in different directions. That can also be uh, some sometime in the future, but that also requires obviously communication between the car and then the remote intelligence. So with that, I'm finishing the presentation and um, leave open all these questions for discussions. Thank you. Urant, you are on mute. Yep. I, I'm on mute, sorry. Yes. So, Tomas, uh, we, I passed you the presenter, right? So yes, please thank you. I already sharing. shared my screen okay. and hopefully you are getting to see the presentation. It, uh, yes, it's coming. To you. Yeah, something is going to come. Do you see it? Yes. Wonderful. So sorry for the technical delays, WebEx abandoned us uh, all on mobile and on, on PC, but I just wanted to briefly share that um, just uh, last week I was almost hit by a Tesla while I was biking in the evening and then it just didn't want to stop uh, at me when, when uh, he had to yield, or it, it would have had to yield. And I believe that it was the auto stop function that, uh, that saved me from that crash because uh, definitely it uh, didn't look for a while that it would ever stop. So I, I can't, can't urge developers to put more functions uh, into the cars and uh, let me just drive back a little bit to the original topic that, that we were addressing the situation awareness and uh, just uh, leaning back a little bit uh, where we come from and why we are investigating it. I'm the Director General of the University Research and Innovation Center at Ubuda University and um, my primary focus is in medical robotics but a couple of years ago we started to investigate um, within this particular frame self-driving cars and handover situation because that seems to be a key. A key to what? Well, it has been a common sense, and again, like, I don't want to repeat, everyone knows it, but there are millions of people dying on the roads, and we want to save them, and that's the primary factor and the time savings through which the industry pures billions and billions of dollars into self-driving cars and the whole development. And this has been nicely represented in some of these research and development efforts that uh, the others, uh, other panelists have shown you. But what we want to avoid, and, and I think this is very critical at current stage, we have a good old nice way of testing uh, systems as cars as they used to be, like really a utensil, uh, a mechatronic system that doesn't do really anything else that you put it together, it should work and that's it. Your car was never supposed to make decisions. And this is the big, 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 big problem when we start trusting our cars and this is the particular issue we started to examine and without really wasting time on the videos behind these screenshots, you can clearly see when people are just neglecting all safety rules and in you know, doing whatever they want to do in their self-driving cars. What the problem is that current vehicles on the road, and these, these are like two-year-old video footages, so it's not, not even the, the latest, greatest uh, software that, that is running on those vehicles, but people overtrust these systems, and at level three, this is what happens then. Some famous or rather infamous accidents with Tesla and some with other uh, cars that simply could not make the right decision. What's the problem? Even if the car realizes by the software that something is not going the right way, it gives you a heads up like beep, 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 or some emergency signals, and that's what comes then the handover. And if you're able to do it well, like uh, I sh if more time were given, I, I could really uh, show you some videos when people are managing to, to deal with it at such a sort, short notice, but we have to become you know, like these superhuman reflex, uh, given that like I'm reading my, you know, my phone, whatever in front of me, and all of a sudden I'm facing a critical situation, which is already messed up. Otherwise, the software wouldn't have failed. And this is when situation awareness comes into the picture. Really, the 
dynamic understanding of the scene and all the possible action that I can take and what it happens. And I can really be sad only to report that humans are terrible at that. So we are not able to maintain easily our situation awareness. We're not able to easily uh, switch task and, and really recognize what's going on. So I do believe that that even teleoperation is a, is a safe way or, or kind of like a diversion or version to this situation are going to have a major role in the coming years because we want to avoid that kind of dip in terms of how technology is uh, not providing us the results that we are expecting. And my research team is exactly working on this, quantifying situation awareness, because um, yeah, to answer your question, Laurent, in some German experience, experiments, some subjects took seven to eight seconds to make any decision after the alert was sound. So imagine that, like, it's a life-threatening alert. You are on a highway, running at 100, 120, whatever, and it takes you seven seconds because you're so lost, you don't know what's happening, maybe you fell asleep or so, but seven seconds is, is more, more than sure that you're going to die of that. So we want to quantify that and we want to reintegrate these kind of better understanding of different levels of situation awareness so that car manufacturers can really design and build in more advanced safety features. And it's not only for the roads, because what we are already seeing is that for the aerial self-driving drones or self-commuting aerial vehicles, they're going to be a huge, huge technological challenge to, to really overcome this difficulty when there the alarm is sound, what will you do? So with that, I just want to pass it back and thank you very much for having us here. Thank you very much. Let me try not to speak on mute again. Uh, okay, so uh, let me change myself back to presenter and uh, show you the uh, this one. And uh, just a second, yeah, like that. Okay, uh, so now we come to the panelist part of the. Uh, of the event. Let me see if I can still have see the chat if I'm sharing. Yes, I can. Uh, and the Q and A. Q and A. It seems. Yeah, I can as well. Okay. So I have. I simply have two questions. So one from uh, Peter Karakesh. He says here that. Uh, uh, Emergency braking and lane uh, keeping uh, is a problem because they have been tested a series of vehicles and major flaws were experienced, like emergency brakes on highways at 130 kilometers per hour without an obstacle, fast detection of lane violation resulting in dangerous braking. So these are some some examples that have occurred. So uh, the Maybe most the rhetorical question is how can we make the system bulletproof to avoid uh, losing trust? So maybe question goes first to to Shandor. So what's your view? How, when will these be bulletproof? And oh, yeah, yes, mm, the process of making an AI bulletproof is indeed a hard task. For this, we have to make sure that we can search for the critical corner cases of our solutions of our algorithms. And after this, we have to solve this problem with algorithms or with data or with both. Of course, because we are living in a data driven uh, world. But from 2022, the AI will not grab the wheel from humans, but it will act like an assistant. And I would mm -hmm. like to highlight that our multifunctional cameras are equipped with lidars and cameras also. So to generate a false positive object for both sensors at the same time, it is, uh, it is very unlikely. Not to mention if it has to produce this false positive detection in some subsequent frames. Mm -hmm. And uh, lidars and radars are quite good at finding out if there is an object in front of us or not. So we don't have to depend only on the camera. But of course, we make lots of tests to verify this. And I have to admit, I didn't hear any any AI related emergency break on the highway with our solution. 
and uh, Continental AI solutions are on the road for years. Okay, thanks a lot. Good, good question. Good, good answer. Uh, and I, I, there is a subsequent one on early drops on the early uh, drops on the market could da could damage technology acceptance by the masses. So yes, I, I think that's that's true. But as you mentioned, uh, in, in the case of Continental, you have not experienced uh, something like this. Yes, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I can say a few words again. REI, okay. AI engineers ready for 2022? I would say yes. There are cards which won five stars on the NCAP challenge with Continental Sensors and Continental AI. And I have to highlight the fact that we are not talking about the fully autonomous driving, what I mentioned. We are working on a technology that will enable certain functions. So we are only talking about certain functions, which are much easier to fulfill that mm -hmm. than the fully autonomous vehicles. For example, emergency braking. We have more than one sensor to detect the emergency and software is, is not everything. The quality really depends on the hardware also. But at Continental, the hardware and software are in the same hand. So it, it is an important point, I think. Mm -hmm. We make sure it is not an early drop. We really make sure. I would rather say that we will bring these AI related features from the high end cars to all cars from 2022. And I, can, and I can tell you about that. I see a tons of output videos of our solutions, of course. And there were several cases when the AI was much better than me because it could detect things what I missed. So I think AI engineers are ready for 2022. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. So maybe one for Tomas now. So we have seen these teleoperator screens and, and the cockpits and so on. and. Uh, uh, okay, so you mentioned eight, nine seconds, and so on. Uh, and do you do you expect that? So if that uh, that use case flies, and then there will be really uh, tele operators. Do you think there will be trained people to to do that, uh, or will they experience fatigue after having handled, uh, let's say, let's say twenty cases a, uh, an hour or something like that? So how do you see that materializing in practice? Um, I believe that those people are going to be very, very highly trained and highly skilled. So something similar that the, the rally uh, drivers that they have superhuman reflexes, a significant amount of practice in, in real time driving. And of course, they will be trained to what, what to pay attention to, what are the most common sequences. It might mm -hmm. also be possible that, you know, some people are going to be specifically trained with left, uh, left driving or right lane driving uh, circumstances, some with certain different types of cars. So, at that point, really, fraction of a second might count as a life saving uh, action or, or niche in which people can do meaningful braking, uh, steering for avoidance, or any, any other action. So, we believe that, uh, that yes, they will be very highly estimated. So, it's do not expect something like in you know, a cheap uh, uh, phone call or call center outsourced somewhere where, where you know, the wages are low and then, then you know, it's, it doesn't matter time differences. So, these are going to be like, like, the, the people that our lives going to depend on. And I believe that uh, not even car manufacturers, but most probably insurance companies going to be behind it. So they will sell you that insurance. Like, look, our people are, you know, the best of the best. They win all fighter simulation championships, whatever. Uh, and then we can guarantee that, you know, 95.9% of the cases are teleoperators who can save your life, whatever happens under these conditions, just pay us in a few thousand dollars per month. So I think yeah, this, yeah. it's going to be a huge mm -hmm. business. Therefore, it's going to be uh, going to be built on on the experience that we have. And um, in terms of overload and capacity, uh, I think it's going to be scalable. Because as as soon as you you know, like you know, it, on the large scale, it's very predictable how many adverse events are happening on the roads. Of course, it's you know there are like sudden winter conditions. Probably everyone got get stuck on uh, slippery icy roads. Then you're going to need to provide help. I believe this could also be you know a service that like you know the 85 plus people uh, in the US that they are still driving, but they can't can't park reverse, then they would press a button and then, you know, even if the car can make it for some reason, uh, they could, you know, some, use someone help, someone others teleoperational help to, to park their car and such things. And then you could charge by the minute or by the second that the that this teleoperation took place. And again, for that, you don't need high, the highest skills. So all these could be monitored and then then really Put into the right place in terms of technology and value, economic value. I believe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, it just occurred to me that, that maybe maybe to decide that this is a left-hand side uh, 
corner case or right hand side, you need a, an AI system in between <laughs> to decide and to assign it to the to the person. Okay, thanks. So let's let, let me have one question to uh, to Andras. So uh, so have you really encountered addresses that look like th those patches that you uh, that you showed that fool the person detector? So is th is that really a threat? Like, could a Tesla overrun a strangely dressed person who is miscategorized as a feature in the landscape? Do you think that's something that could happen? So uh, I think it could could happen, but uh, if you also uh, allow me, I just want want to go back and and extend one thing there because uh, I think it's important that like like towards the acceptance of these systems and these things. Chandor mentioned like two possibilities, like like how we can improve an algorithm that like uh, we, we can also gather more training data or use better algorithms. But I also think that also a third option, which is going like partially related to adversarial attacks that we can also limit the space in which these are, are operating. So I think that that's also mentioned here that uh, I envision that these systems will not be introduced first. That, that, like you can use them openly anywhere where like anything could happen and any could, anybody could like step in front of the vehicle. I, I really see that they are like currently used in like airports and controlled environment. And I think like this could be like step by step extended toward like operating in downtown areas and adding one or two streets which are like from where like like training data is like fr frequently gathered and and this is how like uh, you can like like somehow reach like really autonomous self-driving at like like anywhere uh, and like going back to your question sorry so like like these patches i think like 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 really typical that like adversarial attacks like like won't just happen uh like 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 as randomly or what just occur like, like like a random coincidence in nature, but a malevolent person can can deliberately do this. I don't know any like like practical cases or luckily I haven't heard about when someone really tried this. I know that like like people did this with Teslas, like with experiments that like uh, mm -hmm. you don't have you don't need access to the neural network. You just need to access to the output of that. And you can also like design a pattern which can like like uh, works as a camouflage and, and put it on yourself and a Tesla will not detect you with the uh, with the cameras yeah. and you can do this with all the other systems of course with lidar it requires a, a different kind of patterns but everything that uses deep learning you can use this use this method so uh they they, they exist and i think that's a threat it's not a threat that like like will happen like 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 randomly or these patterns will occur but but we have to think about malevolent persons because i i think the problem here is that if a system goes out it will be present in like thousands of cars if <laughs> like like for humans luckily our vision system is different like i might miss a sign but you or some other person will most probably will see that because we also have these things that like i don't know my site might not be that good in like uh low light conditions and these things but if 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 an attack is there or a sign is covered it will not be seen by any of the cars and that that could lead like really like dramatic or or drastic uh consequences mm -hmm. yeah thanks okay we are Slightly over time, maybe one final question I would have to, to towards Peter. So, Peter, you mentioned the uh, the hazard indications and uh, that that those this, those could be let's say seen helpful or or not helpful at all because it uh, messes your attention up. So, how, how do you ma imagine that? So, do you imagine a, a dashboard on top of the wind uh, screen or? Uh, uh, is that really a self-driving feature? Or is it an assisted driving feature in, in your view, or both actually? But currently, it is clearly an assisted driver because you, as a human driver, are fully responsible for uh, processing every input, including that uh, alert. Mm -hmm. And how it should be delivered? I think this is open question. It, it is the companies who are making the cars who are heavily investing in this research. What is most convenient, not distracting? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, is okay. still, it still has to go a long way. This is my personal experience with, I don't disclose what car I'm driving, but <laughs> <laughs> still. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So let, let that be the, the final word then, because we are slightly over time. So I would like to thank you all uh, to the panelists uh, for, the, for the nice presentations and uh, the, the live session. I would like to thank the audience for the active uh, participation in, in asking questions and uh, sorry for the small technical glitches that we have uh, that we have had during the session so with that i think uh, we would uh, 
close this and I will stop the uh, the the recording now. And uh, yeah, whoever.